Now, one thing we have to be very careful about in history is the problem of anachronism, right? It's very easy for us to take what we know now and project it backwards. So right now, for example, the United States is a powerful, relatively wealthy country. But throughout this period that we're talking about in the 19th century, the United States was comparatively poor and comparatively weak, especially if we look at it compared to an imperial power like Britain or France. The rise of the United States, um, or you could say once the United States has risen, that's really after World War I. Right. So we can think of the United States in this time period as a country that's rising, but is not yet risen. And that's very important if we want to understand the American relationship with Korea during this time period. Right. The United States is rising, but not yet risen. And so, for example, and this is a, a term used in diplomatic history. We can call the United States a jackal power. And what that means is this. You know how like a, a lion might kill an animal? Uh, kills its prey, and then what comes and eats it, the prey after the, the lion is done are the jackals. Right? So the jackals may not actually kill prey, uh, they just eat what the lion doesn't want. And in a sense, the jackals let the lions do the dirty work. That's kind of what the United States was doing during this time period. Right? We would let Britain or France come into a country and then uh, you know, open the country and then we would uh, and get trade privileges. And then we would come in after them and say, hey, we want those trade privileges too. And it was a lot easier to get them because the British and French had already done it. Now, you may say, well, wait a second. What about Matthew Perry? Uh, he's the guy that this American naval commodore who forces Japan to open its doors in 1853. You're right to bring that up. But that's more the exception than the rule. Right. For the most part, the American uh, diplomatic efforts in this time period are reactive, not proactive. They are focused on trying to gain whatever benefits they can at the least possible cost, right? The United States is not militarily powerful compared to France or Britain. It's not as wealthy as France as Britain, does not have the same size of an empire as those countries. You know, we're really behind. And that's one thing that you, you, you want, we need to emphasize there, right? During this time period, we're talking about, especially in under, order to understand the government policy towards Korea. Don't think of Commodore Matthew Perry in this powerful United States. That was kind of an exception. The rule was a weaker United States where we have even trouble just paying our uh, diplomats. And I'm not kidding. We actually had trouble paying our diplomats during this time period. But what's key is we also have to understand is that while American diplomatic policy and American government policy in Washington is one thing, it doesn't mean that all Americans, especially Americans who are not in the government, it's not something that they're, uh, that they're necessarily concerned with. They may have a different perspective. So, for example, remember I said that the Day Won Gun is in charge from 1863 to 1873. Uh, there's this idea that he follows his foreign policy. We don't want to have anything to do with the outside world. In 1866, an American ship, not an American military ship, a merchant ship, but one that's armed, is going to try and force its way into northern Korea, basically goes up a river uh, and wants to trade, wants to open uh, Korea to trade. And the Korean, say, Korean government says, we don't want anything to do with this. Get out of here. And it would appear that the uh, people, the, the Americans on the General Sherman don't act properly. Uh, there's allegations they kidnap like a Korean official. They fire on Koreans and then they get stuck in the river, they get stuck on a sandbar, and the Koreans destroy their ship and then will um, kill them all. And uh, by the way, in North Korea, this is still celebrated. This is a North Korean stamp celebrating the uh, General Sherman's destruction. And uh, it's interesting that Kim Il-sung, the first dictator of North Korea, claims to be, uh, they, they claim that his grandfather, I believe, helped lead the attack on the General Sherman. But in any case, this kind of initial contact between Americans and Koreans does not go well, right? The Americans uh, looking for trade are overly aggressive, and the Koreans respond with uh, a large amount of violence, so it is kind of hard to blame them. Uh, I should also point out that there is an American Protestant missionary on this ship who is killed trying to give a Korean a Bible um, during this attack. So this is this first kind of initial response. Uh, connection between the two. And this does appear in the diplomatic records. And the Americans don't know what happens to General Sherman for a long time. They just know it disappears in Korea. And they're going to make all these efforts to try and find out what happened to it. And that might be an interesting uh, research project to kind of look at that. 
But the Americans do not give up. They will continue to try and find out what happened to General Sherman and to find what um, they can do to bring trade to Korea. And that's going to lead to what's called the Oper Incident of 1868. Uh, this is a picture of a, of a tomb, which is on top of a really, really big mound. And this is a picture I took, and I was part of a conference on the Oper Incident. Uh, and you can see the, the conference, my fellow conference presenters and the sponsor there checking out the tomb. But that is the tomb of the Korean king's grandfather. That would be the Daewongun's father. That's his tomb there. And basically what happened was there was a man named Ernst Opert, who was from uh, the free city of Hamburg. You could basically call him German. And he partnered with a French Catholic priest. And they wanted to force Korea to open its doors to trade and to stop killing Catholics. Right? The Korean government, remember, was persecuting Catholics. And so they hatched on this, uh, this idea of going to Korea on a ship and trying to force Korea to open its doors. And when their plan, and this is very controversial, but was basically to steal the bones of the Korean king's grandfather and hold them hostage, hold them for ransom. So I want to repeat that because I, I think people just when they hear this, when I, when I talk about this in class, their jaws kind of drop. The plan was to steal the bones of the Korean king's grandfather and not give them back until Korea agreed to open to trade and to stop persecuting Catholics. Uh, and they will attempt to do this. This will fail completely. Uh, they do get to the tomb, but the, the, they don't have the proper equipment to actually get through the stone. Uh, there's, the Koreans have put a heavy stone slab on over the tomb, over the bones. So they're not able to steal it. They do manage to escape, and this causes a lot of problems. Now, you may say, well, what does this have to do with the United States? The man who financed the expedition, right, the third person, was a man named Frederick Jenkins, who was an American. And not only was he an American, he was actually from South Carolina. He was born in Charleston. And he was a uh, businessman who engaged in a lot of shady business and funded this whole operation. And he was actually put in trial by the American consul of Shanghai in China because of what he did in Korea. Uh, he gets off uh, without any, because of a lack of evidence, he's not punished. But this uh, illustrates, again, this attempt to get Korea to, to open and there are, like I said, there is American involvement in this, and there's lots of documents, and not a whole lot, uh, a huge amount has been written on English, so this might be interesting for people to look at. Another uh, incident is the Battle of Kanghua Island. Uh, this time, an American naval vessel has come to Korea to say, hey, what happened to the General Sherman, and would you guys like to trade? And the Koreans say, no, we would not. Please leave. And the Americans won't leave, so the Koreans start shooting at us, so we attack uh, Kanghua Island. Uh, Kanghua Island defended a, uh, the, the river that, um, that leads to the Korean capital, what's now called Seoul. So it was a very important strategic place. And the Americans, we show up at this island knowing it's a strategically important place, and the Koreans don't like us being there, and that's what leads to the fight. Because, you know, we could, if we wanted to, take our boats up the river and then attack the capital. Now the Americans will attack the island, defeat the island, but then we will just leave, like we'll defeat the island garrison, we'll leave. And so the Koreans will actually consider this a victory because even though uh, in the battle, very few Americans were killed and we defeated the Koreans and destroyed their cannon, uh, in fact, uh, they will see it as a victory because we left, right? We were there to try and get Korea to for be open to trade and to find out what happened to the General Sherman. Uh, we don't do either of those things. We do take that big Korean flag, though, there. That's a big Korean flag that the American soldiers seized. Uh, but that is something else that people might be interested in looking at. What's going to happen is five years later, the Japanese will go to the very same island. The defenses have been rebuilt. The Japanese will, will, manage, will provoke the Koreans into firing on them. They will then use that as a justification to seize the island and to threaten to invade Korea if the Koreans do not open uh, to uh, trade, if the Koreans do not sign a treaty. And... What's important to note is that the Daewongun is no longer in charge of Korea. Uh, his son is now of age to rule, and so his son is ruling Korea, and he's interested in having a more open uh, policy towards the world, and so he accepts this treaty. So in 1876 now, Korea will be open 
um, in a sense, to the world, or at least to the Japanese part of the world, right? This is, in a sense, Korea's first modern treaty. Uh, however, Korea's first actual treaty with a Western country will be with the United States. Uh, in 1880, a, the Chinese will actually advise the Koreans that they should have a treaty with the United States. And a Chinese official will actually write a little pamphlet called A Policy for Korea, in which he encourages Korea to basically form an alliance with the United States. Uh, the argument is the United States is far away. It doesn't have a big Asian empire, so it's likely not to be a threat, but it could be a valuable friend, right? We're too far away to really threaten the Koreans. Britain and France are much more of a threat because they have, they're in China and they're very powerful in China. Japan is much more of a threat because it's right there. So why not look to the United States? And in particular, Russia was seen as a huge threat to Korea. The U.S., though, was not expanding that much territorially uh, in this time period, right? We were still kind of focusing in, in many ways on uh, focusing on the expansion on the, the North, uh, North American continent. So the Chinese saw us as not being particularly a threat as being a friend, which could maybe help Korea. So based on that advice, in 1882, the United States and Korea will sign a, relate, will sign a treaty and establish formal diplomatic relationships. There is a major problem, though, in how we understand this treaty. And this will drive American and Korean kind of diplomatic relations for the next 30 years or so. So the U.S. interests are mostly, we just want a treaty for the safety of our people that might come to Korea to trade, that might be, uh, one thing that the United States is very interested in during this time period is uh, whaling. And we want to make sure that any American sailors who are out whaling around Korea, if they get washed ashore, the Koreans will treat well. Uh, Koreans actually typically did treat uh, Americans who washed ashore sailing, uh, whaling well, um, even before the treaty. They didn't just kill Americans uh, for no reason. They killed the people in the General Sherman because they basically invaded Korea. But before that time, there were cases of Koreans returning American sailors who had washed ashore. So the U.S. main interests were safety of our people who might be in Korea. And in particular, we just wanted to have an open door for commerce. We wanted to be able to trade in Korea. Uh, during This treaty said nothing about missionaries uh, being legal or anything like that. Uh, missionaries are still not supposed to come to Korea. However, the Koreans saw this as much more important. They saw this as being related to their security. Remember, as we talked about previously, Korean diplomacy is driven by the desire for security. So the Korean interests were driven by what, what's called a good offices clause in the treaty. And I, I've included a quote of that because I think it's very important. There shall be perpetual peace and friendship between the President of the United States and the King of Chosun and the citizens and subjects of their respective governments. If other powers deal unjustly or oppressively with either government, the other will exert their good offices on being informed of the case to bring about an amicable arrangement, thus showing their friendly feelings. The Americans just said, well, this is just what you do in a treaty. And all it says is basically that if someone's bullying Korea, we will talk to them nicely. If someone's beating up on Korea, we will ask them nicely to stop. The Koreans, in contrast, understood this as the Americans pledging to protect Korea. So we had completely different understandings of what this treaty did. So this is kind of a problem. Uh, the Koreans thought that this was serving their security interests. It didn't. Now, one thing, though, also the Koreans wanted from the United States related to security was they were hoping that Americans would come in and help them modernize. Uh, particularly American companies would come in and do things like build power plants, which they did do. Uh, they also wanted American advisors to tell them how to modernize their government. And also, this was connected, of course, to American business interests, all this together, because, of course, American advisors would say, yes, if you want to modernize, you should hire American businesses to do that. And by the way, my cousin operates a business and you should totally bring him on board. There's a lot of corruption in this. And what also confused the Koreans then was there was a difference between what Washington wanted, which was basically to not have much involvement in Korea at all, beyond just protecting the safety of its citizens, encouraging commerce a bit. And those are what we would call the man on the spot. Uh, the actual diplomats and business people and advisors working in Korea all naturally wanted the United States to have more of a role in Korea, right? If I'm a business person doing business in Korea, I would love it if the United States had more influence in Korea, right? And if I'm a diplomat in Korea, I would much rather prefer that the, Korea is important for the United States because then I'll have stuff to do and I'll have more prestige. So one thing that was a problem was 
on one side, Americans working in Korea were always giving this kind of impression to the Koreans. Oh, yeah, the United States really cares, is really interested in helping to develop Korea and all these things. But Washington never really accepted this advice. They just wanted to kind of keep hands-off approach to Korea, don't get too involved. We're not a very powerful country. We're not all that strong. We're not all that wealthy. We just want to make a little bit of money in Korea and keep our people safe. That's it. We certainly don't want to be in, in any kind of security alliance with Korea. That will just cause us trouble. Two important early American diplomats in Korea who are interesting and who have left behind a good amount of written records that you could look at are Lucius Foote and George Folk. Right. These are both people that you could uh, examine who have left behind writings if you want to look at questions about early American diplomacy with Korea. The entrance of Protestant Christianity in Korea is very closely connected to the beginning of this kind of relationship between the United States and Korea in 1882. So missionary work is still technically illegal in Korea. Uh, the Korean government at this time period doesn't really understand the difference between Catholics and Protestants. It's just like, well, they're all Christians. We don't want them around. What happens, though, is that now that you have a American legation, like American diplomats in Korea, they need a doctor. And they bring in a doctor who was also a missionary, a guy named Horace Allen. Right? He's a, 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 an American medical missionary, fascinating person because he will eventually stop being a missionary and will become an American uh, diplomat in Korea. He will also have businesses on the side. So he's he kind of brings all these things together. So he's a fascinating person. Some people have written on him. Uh, I think more could be written about him. But Horace Allen is going to be this guy who comes in secretly as a missionary, officially as the a medical doctor. And I want to highlight this was common among Protestant missionaries to have uh, medical doctors as missionaries. And you can kind of see why when we look at how the uh, Protestants achieve unofficial tolerance. Um, we'll talk about this more later, but in Korea, there's going to be these factions that will develop in politics. Um, there's a faction that's pro-Chinese that wants only limited reform, that doesn't really want to change much. And this is dominated by the Haiyangban. There's also a group of people that are more pro-Japanese that want to make Korea much more modern, undergage, undertake radical reform, and they are connected to um, mostly with people who are from uh, who are educated like Yangban who but who are lower Yangban or might be the sons of concubines and so are not eligible technically to sit for the civil service exams. Those people, the more radical reformers, are going to launch a coup in 1884 and seriously injure the nephew of the king's queen, a man named Min Yong Ik. He's part of the conservative group. And Horace Allen, will be called in and save his life, uh, literally. Min Yong Ik is uh, chopped up with swords. Western uh, medicine is pretty good at surgery. So Horace Allen will be brought in to help Min Yong Ik. He will live. The Korean government knew that this guy was a missionary, uh, even though he was officially there as a doctor. They just didn't want to make a big issue of it. And after this, they are like, you know what? These Protestant missionaries, they're all right. And they will increasingly allow for Protestant missionaries to come in to Korea and act as Protestant missionaries. It's complex, so I don't want to go into it in too much detail here, but this marks an important moment where because the Korean government sees that Protestant Christianity can be useful, like it literally saved this guy's life and can help in modernization, such as developing modern medicine, they're going to tolerate Protestant Christian missionaries. A couple documents that also might be useful to kind of look at uh, if you're interested in this time period are these early travel logs. So for example, there's one by a naval surgeon describing Korea in 1884. And there's also one by George Clayton Folk, who would also become a diplomat to Korea. And so these are things that you could look at if you're interested in looking at how these early Western people to Korea, how they perceived Korea and how they presented it. There is also a lot of information on Protestant missionaries. Uh, an interesting couple is Reverend Horace G. Underwood and Dr. Lilius Underwood. Uh, they got married in Korea. So um, it's kind of a fascinating story because Reverend Horace Underwood, of course, was a reverend. He, he was clergy. Uh, Dr. Lilius Underwood actually came as a doctor uh, and worked as a doctor. And you can see how this would kind of question, challenge, in a sense, how Koreans understood proper gender relations and how a lot of women were excited um, about the possibilities of, of new opportunities. And Dr. Lilius Underwood herself was very much wanting to transform 
uh, the lives of Korean women, not just in a kind of Christian sense uh, of getting them to believe in Jesus, but also in terms of changing their lives uh, in this world. And these two things often went together. For these uh, Protestant missionaries, they, they saw Christianity as not simply being about certain things you believe about Jesus. They saw Christianity as the very source of a superior Western civilization, which was democratic and free. And they wanted to bring that to Korea. So the missionaries are really fascinating to study uh, for a wide variety of reasons. You can study them focused on religion uh, in a narrow sense, of, but you can also focus on it more broadly as how they're trying to transform these things. There were limits, because one thing I think is fascinating is once they got married, it was understood that Dr. Underwood, uh, the medical doctor, would stop practicing medicine full time and just, and I shouldn't say just, but, but would basically become a housewife who just practiced medicine in her spare time. So there were limits to their understanding of um, gender equality and things like that, but still fascinating to study. And there are a lot of sources on these people, and surprisingly little has been written about them in English. A lot of the early production of knowledge about Korea was done by missionaries or people connected to the missions, and you can find these in things like the Korean Repository, which was active from 1890, in 1892, and then again from 1895 to 1898, and the Korean Review, which was active between 1901 and 1905. These are widely acceptable or widely uh, accessible, and I think are very interesting. It gives a lot of information for how Korea is being seen uh, by Western people at the same at this time. And another interesting book to look at would be this uh, Korea, the Hermit Kingdom by William Griffiths. Uh, what's fascinating about him is he had lived in Asia for a long time, but in Japan, uh, he taught Japanese students. And you can see him there in the middle um, among all these Japanese students. And he wrote a book about Korea. But it's interesting because he wrote about someone who was coming from a more Japanese perspective. So that's an interesting work to look at.